Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle, and today we have with us Tim Cole, who is the founder and CEO of The Compass Alliance. Welcome to the program, Tim. Thank you, Mike. Hey, so give us a little bit of uh, background of your entrepreneurial journey and um, tell us a little bit about your coaching firm, what kind of clients you work with, but um, what first gave you the entrepreneurial bug? Well, you know, I, context, uh, I think in the classic sense, I'm not sure if I fit the, the, the true mold of an entrepreneur. I stumbled mm-hmm. into the healthcare pharmaceutical arena about 37 years ago. And I did that because at the time I was thinking, well, I'd like to have a job where I can learn how to sell, negotiate, and maybe build a little bit of a financial portfolio. I went through over the course of the 37 years that followed something that uh, approximates 30 downsizings, restructures, mergers, acquisitions. And there came a time, Mike, when I looked around and after having had a, a, a fairly successful career and realized that most of the peers that I'd started with were gone, and most of them washed away for a variety of reasons, but a lot of times because of downsizings. And I began to reflect on how had I managed to survive. And the reality is I'd like to tell you I was the smartest and the most intuitive and had the greatest business acumen, but really what allowed me to survive is that at some point in my career, I began to embrace the fact that if I was going to make it, I couldn't depend on a manager or a department or a company. And so I built my own version of a career compass. In time, as I began to counsel other people that either work for me or with me, I began to realize there might be some value there to other people that are really challenged in building a successful career. And out of that came the idea of the genesis of the compass solution, a guide to winning your career. And and back then, you didn't even know what it would be called. You just kind of were noticing things and as, as you were reflecting, you know, kind of like um, you hear that same kind of example with, you know, top salespeople. Hey, why, why are you so successful? And they'll say, I don't know. And then when people start observing them, they're like, well, you know, you always return phone calls promptly. You always, you know, whatever the case is. And I think it, I find it fascinating when someone says what you just did, which is I found myself successful. I started reflecting. I noticed these certain things. And then I'm sure that just started, you know, formulating and forming that blueprint and checklist. And you called it a compass. And that's, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about some of those, you know, major milestone pillar type things that are part of the compass. Well, let me begin by saying that I'd love to say it was my innovation that led to some of the uh, content. It was really adversity. Uh, Mm -hmm. The industry I went into was such that there was so much adversity that if you didn't begin to think in different ways, you probably weren't going to make it. And when I began to look at who really was most accountable for my career, it wasn't my manager or my department, I began to ask myself, okay, if I'm going to get to where I want to be, how am I going to do it? And that began with building what really became, I guess, for lack of a better term, the lodestar for the compass, which, and I'll, I'll simplify it for the purposes of our conversation. The book goes into far greater detail, but the, the north star, the lodestar for the compass is, in fact, personal accountability. And I began to take a look at the people around me that thrived in adversity and that many more that didn't. And I began to embrace the fact that the people that made it somehow had an attitude that said, regardless of what happens, I'll find a way. And even if it's difficult, and even if there are problems, and even if there are things that are happening to me that aren't fair, I'll still take accountability for what I can do and how I can learn and how I can move on. And so in time, I began to study those people, watch the, and frankly, role model them, and I used that to benchmark what I call the North Star of the Compass, which is personal accountability. And when you take a look at the book, The Compass Solution, I go into far greater detail to talk about what's really involved in building a high level of personal accountability. But again, I'd love to take the credit for having that intuition. I didn't. I think I got to a point where in the middle of the jungle, I had to come up with something. And that's when it began to form in my mind. 
Yep, <laughs> that's, that's a good point. You know, it's interesting you, you focus on personal accountability because I know that we we would all feel like, you know, oh, that's kind of cliche, and oh, accountability, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the antithesis of that would be blaming other people. So it's about the time you start realizing that I'm in this situation right now, whatever that might be, and you don't look around and go, yeah, but, well, you know, that person could have and I should have had. When you stop doing that and you take that personal accountability of here's where I am, it's my – not necessarily fault, but it's my doing. And then now to get out of it, I need to do X, Y, and Z, and I need to be accountable to myself. Because in reality, you know, it's kind of like the airplane uh, example. You know, you it sounds so counterintuitive to say, you know, give yourself the oxygen first because you've got your child right next to you. But if you're not around to help them, then you're both gone. So I think that's a really neat concept. Is that kind of where you were going with that personal accountability uh, lodestar? Oh, Mike, you got it dead on. In fact, <clears throat> a couple hundred people wrote this book. Now, I don't give them credit. Because <laughs> they were part of your uh, your your whole career and, and relationships and legacy and all that, right? That's exactly right. And one of them yeah. uh, said, he always used something that resonated for me. And I worked with him when I was in my 20s. He said, hey, Tim, it ain't fair, but it's there. And, oh, and, neat. And, and I always smiled about it because he was a very funny guy. But I think what he was trying to say, Exactly, Mike, what you said. Hey, look, you can either take accountability and say, what can you do? Or you can take the other tack, which is victimology. And you know, having been a part of uh, a number of entrepreneurial uh, endeavors as well as being in businesses, a lot of people fall into the latter. Those are the ones that are probably going to have the greatest difficulties. The ones that embrace the central principle of saying, I own it, I'll find a way, are the ones that generally do. You know, the interesting thing about that, and maybe you've seen this too. Um, have, it, have you ever dealt with with uh, a situation where someone says, "Man, that you know employee just never returns phone calls," or they're so slow in? And there's so many things that you can you list these bullet point list of things that would be negatives. But if you really analyze all of those, to overcome them is not that much. The discipline of returning a phone call the same day or responding to an email or doing the right thing or all of these little uh, uh, you know, actions, it's not earth-shattering. So the point is, what you just said about personal accountability, and most people like to blame and make excuses, it's so easy if you do finally make that decision to make that personal development and be accountable to yourself – you'll distance yourself from your competition so quickly because other people aren't willing to do it, and it really isn't that big of a thing. It just takes some dedication and discipline. You said it well. <clears throat> you know, when when many people have issues arise, their tendency is to, to blame the circumstances or people yeah. around them. But people who embrace the notion of personal accountability say, mm, no, maybe, maybe I have a, a stake in this, and I think it's easy to point to all the other things rather than to take that on. One of the things I talk about in the book, and again, <clears throat> this is a functional guide. There's some theory there, but it's a really functional how to survive and thrive in your career. But one of the things I, I've taught over the years to the people I've worked with is that, and this is my opinion, probably not defensible, I think every one of us has two tools we carry with us. One is a magnifying glass and one is a mirror. The magnifying mm -hmm. glass is overdeveloped because we use that to look at everyone else in the world around us. The mirror, on the other hand, is underdeveloped because that's where you have to look at yourself and ask tough questions. And I know there was a point in my career when I had to embrace the fact that my mirror was really tiny and my magnifying glass was huge. But until I struck a balance in the two, and I call it my own version of emotional intelligence, until I struck that balance, I had a hard time sometimes looking at the person that was most responsible, and that was me. It, so do you find, Tim, that your typical reader or target audience or person or niche or segment or whatever you want to think of it as, um, who typically is the, the audience that needs this? Now, of course, everybody. But do you find a certain niche uh, typically is embracing this concept and your book more than others? Yeah, I, th I think when I began the book, Mike, I began it because the millennials, as I'm sure you're aware, are probably the most disaffected, disengaged uh, mm -hmm of the workforce right now. You know, the Gallup poll last year said 29% are engaged, which implies 71% of millennials aren't engaged. Mm. And I looked at that, and I am the father of two sons, Brandon and David, 34 and 29, and they're millennials, and they're having very successful careers. 
But as I watched their trials and tribulations and the things that they had to go through, I reflected on my own career. And so I started to write the book, The Compass Solution, for that millennial group. And, yeah, that's the primary target audience, and I think the greatest value is there. But I'd also tell you, as I wrote it, I found a lot of contemporaries, people that are struggling to find a path, that there's a value there. And, honestly, where we're getting some of the greatest feedback is from leaders, senior leaders who say, you know what, I can do more to help my people cultivate this notion of becoming the CEO of their career. It's not just Mm -hmm. a function of my telling you what you need to do. I need to cultivate this notion of helping people feed themselves rather than just simply my feeding them. And that, honestly, has turned out to be far bigger, far richer than we thought it would be. Yeah, I I can see that progression where, where you might think, you know, millennials, but then in reality, Many of these concepts, as with as with a lot of things, you know, there's uh, I teach marketing, uh, and there's a lot of things in marketing that are just foundational, and they apply to any situation. You just apply a different nuance or tool or tactic to execute it. But um, to your point, um, sure, we can say that these principles would apply well to millennials, but why wouldn't they apply to someone who's 55 years old in their career leading a team? There's no reason why it shouldn't. Uh, that's very well said, especially since so many. Even baby boomers are finding themselves having to, in some cases, reinvent themselves. I was Mm -hmm. working on an article earlier today talking about the number of baby boomers and Generation Xers that are finding themselves in a situation where they have to reinvent. You know, cutbacks, reorganizations affect everyone. So so you're right. You know, it's funny. When I began research on the book, Mike, one of the things that I had to get my head around, and it's daunting, and I talk about it in the book, If you go to work when you're 21, 22, and you work a typical career, you will invest 100,000 hours in that career, 100,000 hours. And I look at that and say, well, without question, it's the greatest financial investment of your life. And I've seen so many, hundreds, maybe thousands, who didn't treat that so much as an investment as they did a spend and maybe, I hate to say it, sometimes just a gamble, almost with the same degree of critical thinking as if they were going to the local uh, quickie mart to buy a lottery ticket. And unfortunately, their chances of winning their career is about the same of winning the lottery. <laughs> well, you know, here's something interesting when you mention 100,000 hours. You know, the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point 10,000 hour expert whole concept. And then have you ever, you, do you remember this uh, example, you know, hey, well, do you have 10 years of experience in your job or do you have one year of experience 10 times over? And of course, the, the meaning is, are you just clocking in, clocking out, clocking in, clocking out, or are you really digging in and bettering yourself and you've got 10 years of experience? Well, if you take that 100,000 hour deal, what if, you know, what if you did take that 10,000 hours to get an expert in something? You can do that 10 times over and be like an expert you know, magnified if, if you really apply yourself and build upon each year, build upon each learning experience. The problem is millennial X, Y, Z, and at one point we're going to run out of letters. What's going to happen in a couple decades? We're, we're going to have Jen, we're going to start at A again, I guess. Um, but at some point people need to say, you know what, where could I be if I really doubled down and got good and then built next year, built off of this past year and didn't just take that mental punch the clock attitude. And that's for any, any uh, uh, demographic. Very, very true. You know, I, it took me a while to realize that cumulative years of existence does not equal experience. Yep. When I finally recognized that, I, I've met people with five years' experience that are much, much more talented than peers that have 20, and it's because of exactly what you just said. They decided they were going to learn, and they were going to apply those learnings, and, and you hit it. You know, what I do and what what informed the book is I, when I was a kid, I collected everything from baseball cards to comic books to marbles, you name it, I collected it. And I realized over the past many years, what I do now is I collect experiences, I try to collect the learnings that go with it, and then I try to collect the stories that connect the two. And that's what we try to do in the Compass Solution. And then, like you said, you alluded to the fact that this is not just a book. It's a, it's a guide. It's a field guide. It's an implementation because it makes me realize, um, you know, like knowledge is power is really not true. It's the potential power, but you've got to do something with it. So you can collect those experiences. You can collect those stories. But what's it going to be, just in some anthology? Or are you going to look at it and go, you know, here's what I'm noticing. Let's tweak this and fine-tune that and polish this so that now when I look back next quarter or next year, I've um, made that one little nuance uh, of improvement. So um, 
talk a little bit about your uh, how the book will help you become aware of something and then maybe show you now what to do with it. Yes. Yeah, first of all, I appreciate, appreciate the question, and I agree. It, applied knowledge is power. Mm. Knowledge in and of itself is not power. Yeah. So when I began to, uh, to put the book together, and, and I have to say that I put together a series of essays and had a general idea, and then I met someone by the name of Susan Hart in uh, Canada who became my editor, who helped me take that collection of essays, assemble them into an order, and it made the book much better than it would have ever been. But one of the things that we've tried to do, Susan and I, <clears throat> is to build a, an approach that said, okay, half of this book is focused on surviving, and that's the, the, the compass portion. We're going to give you four cardinal points. It begins with personal accountability. It will advance to three others. And what we want you to think about is here is what makes personal accountability come to life. Here's what makes the next cardinal point and the next cardinal point. And our, our game plan is to say if you want a functional, not day by day, but certainly a functional guy that gives you a sense of purpose and a sense of mission, that first part of the book is what it's intended to do. And whether you're 22 or 42, there's value there. But particularly if you're trying to find a path, that's about as close to a GPS or a map system, I think, as you're, mm -hmm. well, and I'm biased, that I think many people will find. <laughs> but then we, we, we began to ask ourselves, okay, and I looked at my career, and I looked at that small percentage of people that didn't just survive. They made it through all the cuts in some cases, but they thrived. And so I devoted a lot of time, I used to run leadership development for one of our legacy companies, looking at what were the skill sets that made people move beyond, go beyond subsistence to really being incredible in their careers. And I talk about three keys in the latter portion of the book, the second half of the book, that I think are, are just absolutely off the board important if you really want to, to have a significant career, not just a, significant, uh, a successful career. One of them, one of them, uh, is something you and I have been talking about. One of those three keys is learning. I finally realized after about my third or fourth year that the people that have decided, well, I'm through with college now, I've got my MBA, whatever it might be, learning, I'll do the basics, but that's all I'm going to do. Those people were lost from the very beginning. Meanwhile, the people that committed to a lifetime of learning, they just zoomed. They just zoomed by people. So that's kind of, a, I guess, a general summary for you. That's awesome. I love it. And um, I would like to just see what's the best way that people can learn more about the book your, and your, your uh, uh, firm. So would they visit your website? Is the book available at bookstores, Amazon? What's the best uh, step that way? Yeah, I can tell you that the best way to learn about the book is to go to our website, which is thecompassalliance.com. The Compass Alliance is my company. The book is The Compass Solution, a guide to winning your career, and it's available already on Amazon. We've had... Uh, 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 well, we're kind of blown away by the success, as a matter of fact, in terms of uh, coaching and uh, mentoring books under the, its category. It's, it's really been almost since day one in the top 100, and it's actually been in the top 10. And uh, we think we're, we're, we've got a good foundation, and we're trying to build on that. But I think the, the best place to go to would be the, uh, the compassalliance.com. You'll get a sense of who I am, what my background is, and maybe more important, the why behind the book. Excellent. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful getting to know you today. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.